Hi there. So because of the, the weather and the road conditions, uh, our meeting for today was canceled, but uh, that doesn't mean that we have to fall behind. So I'm going to be walking us through the material that we would have covered today via video lecture. Actually, stuff that we were planning on covering last week on Friday when classes were canceled. Um, just to kind of like r refresh your memory, we had been talking about arguments. We were talking about what an argument was, uh, the various parts of arguments. We even started getting at looking at the structure of arguments by mapping them at our last meeting last week on Wednesday. What I want us to start looking at today is a way of evaluating the structure of arguments uh, with respect to their quality, and this is going to bring up a new distinction that we haven't seen so far. Perhaps you've seen it before, but we haven't introduced it in this class yet, and it's actually a pretty big one. So uh, when we get into thinking about classifying and evaluating arguments, the big distinction to consider here is whether or not those arguments are considered to be deductive or inductive arguments. The difference between a deductive and an inductive argument has to do with what exactly that argument is aiming for. So we say that a deductive argument is aiming for a certain kind of a, a characteristic where a certain sort of relationship between the premises and conclusions, that we're arriving at the conclusion of a deductive argument with some sort of certainty. One way of talking about this is to say that the structure of support that the deductive argument is aiming for is one where it would be impossible for the conclusion to be false so long as we believe that the premises are true. So for example, let's take a look at the example that we have there under deduction on the Prezi. Uh, all dogs are mammals. Spot is a dog. Therefore, spot is a mammal. If it's true that all dogs are mammals, and it's also true that spot is a dog, then we can see that it has to be the case that Spot is a mammal. There's no way to agree with those premises and deny the conclusion without contradicting yourself, without becoming manifestly irrational. So that's how a deductive argument works. We'll take a little closer look at it in just a second. Um, let's compare that to, like, well, what else would there be? We could also have an inductive argument. An inductive argument is one that's aiming for a structure of support that doesn't necessarily go for that sort of, that sort of uh, certainty that deductive arguments are going for. It doesn't necessarily aim for that airtight structure. Instead, an inductive argument is aiming for a structure of support where it would be incredibly unlikely for the conclusion to be false so long as the premises are true. And we can see the shift from deduction to induction pretty well in comparing the two examples that we have there on the Prezi. The deductive argument that we had said, all dogs are mammals, spot is a dog, therefore spot is a mammal. The example that we have for an inductive argument is most dogs are friendly, Spot is a dog, therefore Spot is probably friendly. The big difference between those two examples is how they start. The first one starts with a premise that says all dogs are mammals. The second inductive one says most dogs are friendly. Now depending on what we mean by most, that could yield a conclusion that is incredibly likely. If we said something like 99.99% of dogs are friendly and Spot is a dog, then it's very, very likely that Spot is friendly. If by most we only mean something like 51%, then maybe it's not as likely. But we can see here that like the structure of that argument, it's not going for the sort of airtight certainty that a deductive argument is going for. Instead, it's going for uh, a, a sort of structure where if the premises are true, the conclusion is probably true. And it's, uh, it probably goes without saying that that sort of inference is not as secure as a deductive inference, um, a good deductive inference, but um, it might be more interesting. It might be more useful. We'll see that as we start to dig into deductive and inductive arguments alternately in coming classes. Meanwhile, <clears throat> let's take a look at um, an example of somebody making some inferences so here we have a uh, clip from a BBC show, Sherlock, um, starring Martin Freeman and uh, Benedict Cucumberbatch. Cumberbatch plays uh, the detective Sherlock Holmes here, and he makes some inferences, and he explains how it is that he made the inferences in this clip. What I'd like you to do is to watch this clip. I'm going to provide the link to the YouTube clip here in the video. And uh, so go ahead and watch that clip. Pause the, the video lecture, watch the clip, and tell me whether the inferences that Sherlock Holmes is making here are deductive inferences or inductive inferences. Go ahead and pause now. Okay, so you watched the clip. Did you decide whether it's deductive or inductive, these sorts of inferences that Holmes is making? What'd you say?
it seems like what's going on here, despite the fact that uh, Sir Arthur Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote, uh, kind of notoriously wrote um, uh, Sherlock Holmes to claim that he was doing deduction whenever he did his kind of detective work. This isn't actually a deductive inference. It's a little bit of a, of a misnomer there on the part of Sir Arthur, Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, these aren't actually deductions, they are inductions. And we know that they're inductions because every, sing every single one of the inferences that Holmes makes here is one where it's possible that he could have been wrong. Perhaps it's vanishingly unlikely that, uh, that he's wrong, but it's at least possible. And in fact, we get a, 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 a nice demonstration of this at the very end of the clip where, Holmes, uh, where, sorry, where Watson points out to Holmes that uh, everything that he had, had inferred here, all of, the, all of the guesses that he made on the basis of the available evidence, while very, very impressive, um, that last one actually wasn't correct. Um, his, the Harry on the phone didn't refer to his brother Harry, it referred to his sister Harriet, so Holmes missed that one little piece. Um, so this is an inductive rather than a deductive argument. And it might be a very good sort of argument that uh, Holmes is making to himself. He might have very, very good reasons for making the inferences that he does, and he might in fact be right almost all the time about them, but it just bears pointing out that the style of inference being employed is not in fact deduction, it's induction. Let's take a closer look at the sorts of things that are going on with deduction. When we think about any sort of argument uh, and we start looking at its structure, one of the things, uh, when, we, when we start evaluating the extent to which it's believable, one of the things that we're going to want to do is we're going to divide that evaluation into two distinct sorts of concerns. On the one hand, we're concerned with the structure. We're concerned with the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. That If those premises are true, what would that tell us about the conclusion? And then, in addition to that, and as a separate concern, we're going to consider whether or not uh, the, the premises are actually true. So on the one hand, we're thinking about structure. And on the other hand, we're thinking about content. Are the premises actually true? And if they were true, what would that tell us about the conclusion? So typically, the way that we do this is we think about the structure first. When we're thinking about deductive arguments, the structure that we're shooting for is one that's called a valid structure. Now, this is a technical term, just like a lot of the technical terms that we've introduced in this class so far. Typically, when people in a non-technical fashion kind of use this word validity, it's uh, just kind of like a vague approval, perhaps. Just like, if that argument is valid, that means I give it the thumbs up. I think it's a pretty good one. I find it believable. Sometimes folks will even talk about a single claim or a single idea being a valid idea or a valid statement. This uh, would be a category mistake if we're thinking about validity in this technical sense. So what is the technical sense? The technical sense is something that we've already kind of, an idea we've already introduced, and it's this. An argument is valid if it's impossible for the conclusion to be false while the premises are true. Here's another way of saying the same thing. An argument is valid if we would say that if those premises are true, then the conclusion would have to be true. So. One way of saying it is, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false while the premises are true. Another way of saying it is, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Here's another way of saying it. The only way that the conclusion of a valid argument could possibly be false is if at least one of the premises was also false. So uh, we can think of like other ways to describe validity as well. We could say something like, the conclusion is necessarily entailed by the premises. We might say something like um, the, the conclusion is uh, logically follows from the premises. Uh, that kind of gets at the same sort of thing, uh, that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And the only way for the conclusion to be false is if at least one of the premises is also false. An argument is invalid if it is possible for the conclusion to be false while the premises are true. So one of the tests that we're going to run in our head when we're considering whether an argument is valid or not is uh, to see if we can try to imagine a scenario where all of the premises of the argument are true, but we could still get a false conclusion. If we can get a if we can think of a scenario like that with true premises and a false conclusion, then this means that the argument's not valid. If we can't possibly think of uh, some scenario where we have true premises but a false conclusion, then it would seem that the argument is valid. Deductive arguments are always aiming for validity. They don't always get it. Sometimes we have a busted deductive argument that you can tell it's going for validity, but it doesn't quite get it. The argument is invalid because it's busted. 
Inductive arguments, on the other hand, we would say they're never valid. They can't possibly be valid. But we might hesitate to call them invalid because it's not like they're somehow lacking validity if they're not even aiming at it. We'll talk about that a little more when we start to look a little deeper at inductive arguments. So there, we've got validity. That's the structural component of a deductive argument. What else is there? Well, uh, before we get to what else is there, let's look at some examples. Let's see if we can figure out whether or not an argument is valid or invalid. It's not going to be difficult here because, in fact, we have uh, them already labeled for us. So consider this one. All reptiles are cold-blooded. Snakes are reptiles. Therefore, snakes are cold-blooded. We already saw a structure like this. We saw it with all dogs or mammals, but now we're talking about reptiles and snakes. So all reptiles are cold-blooded. And snakes are a member of the class of reptiles, all of which are cold-blooded. So snakes have to be cold-blooded as well. That argument is valid. There's just no way for the, for the premises to be true without the conclusion also being true. Consider this one. Four out of five dentists recommend Trident gum. Rachel is a dentist, therefore Rachel recommends Trident. Now, it seems likely that Rachel probably recommends Trident on account of being a dentist and on account of 80% of dentists recommending Trident gum. But because it's only four out of five dentists and not all the dentists recommending Trident gum, this means that there's a possibility that one that like that one out of five dentists that doesn't recommend Trident gum, Rachel is one of those. So because it's possible that four out of five dentists recommend Trident, and Rachel is also a dentist, but not necessarily a dentist that recommends Trident, that means that this argument is invalid. Um, it's not a valid argument. This might in fact be a very good inductive argument, but it's a terrible, terrible deductive argument. It doesn't really quite get to um, the certainty of the conclusion on the basis of the truth of the premises. So uh, let's consider one last one there. Uh, it's clear that the first one's valid, clear that the second one's invalid. Well, let's look at this third one. If the dog barks, then I'm a bologna sandwich. The dog did bark, therefore I'm a bologna sandwich. This argument is actually valid. And if you're sitting there wondering, like, how could that argument possibly be valid, consider what your objection to it might be. Are you thinking that that argument's not valid because I am not, in fact, a bologna sandwich? Is this argument not valid because the conclusion's false? Well, keep in mind that whether an argument is valid or not has nothing to do with whether or not the conclusion is true or false. It has to do with the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, such that if the premises were true, a valid argument would be one where, like, those true premises would guarantee the truth of the conclusion. If the premise, sorry, if uh, it is possible for the conclusion of a valid argument to be false, but it means that at least one of the premises is also false. So let's look at this argument again a little bit closer. If the dog barks, then I'm a bologna sandwich. That premise is actually pretty suspicious, in fact, clearly false. The dog did bark. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I'd have to know more about the dog. Therefore, I'm a bologna sandwich. Disregarding whether the conclusion is true or false, can we see that if those premises are true, if the dog barks, then on a bologna sandwich, and the dog did bark, that means that the conclusion, therefore on a bologna sandwich, does have to be true. This argument is valid. So just because an argument is valid doesn't necessarily mean that its conclusion is true. Is that clear? Just because an argument is valid doesn't mean that its conclusion is true. It just means that if the premises were true, then the conclusion would have to be true. That's all that we mean when we're talking about validity. This concern with whether or not the conclusion is actually true, or whether or not the premises are actually true, brings up a different concern. This is a, a different quality, a different characteristic of a deductive argument. In addition to its validity, we could consider whether or not the argument is what's known as sound. So if an argument is valid, all that means is that if the premises are true, then the conclusion would have to be true. If that argument is valid and on top of that, all of its premises are in fact true, then we say that the argument is sound. So soundness is validity plus all true premises. And we can see that what that leads to, based on the definition of validity and what it would mean to say that all the premises are true, that any argument that is sound is one where the conclusion is beyond a shadow of a doubt believable as true. So if an argument is sound, then by definition we can say with absolute certainty that it's got a true conclusion. So consider uh, the argument all reptiles are cold-blooded, 
Snakes are reptiles, therefore snakes are cold-blooded. That argument is valid, because if the premises are true, the conclusion would have to be true. And on top of that, all of its premises are true, so it's not just valid, it's also sound. Compare that to the argument right below there that is valid but not quite sound. It's valid because if those premises are true, all reptiles are four-legged and snakes are reptiles. If those two are true, then it would have to be the case that the conclusion, snakes are therefore four-legged, would have to be true. But, despite its valid structure, we see that it's got a false conclusion and it also has like one false premise. All reptiles are four-legged, that's just not true. Snakes are reptiles, that one seems to be true. But because I have a false premise, that means that even though the structure of that argument might be valid, that doesn't mean that the conclusion has to actually be true. If the premises were true, then the conclusion would have to be true, but the premises aren't necessarily true in that argument. So it's valid, but it's not sound. If you want a little more information on this, you can check out this very clever, convenient chart, um, uh, one that breaks down all of the possible combinations of true or false premises in comparison to valid and invalid structures. Notice a couple of things going on on this chart. Hopefully the, uh, it'll track the cursor here. Let's see if that goes away. So notice that the only way for an argument to be sound is one is where the argument is valid. And on top of that, we have true premises and a true conclusion. You might think to yourself, like, well, what if the premises are true but the conclusion is false? Well, I could have an argument with true premises and a false conclusion, but not a valid argument with true premises and a false conclusion. There's just no such thing as a valid argument whose premises are true and whose conclusion is false. Because what it means for the argument to be valid is, if the premises are true, the conclusion would have to be true. So there's just no such thing as a valid argument with true premises and false conclusion. There is such a thing as all of the other possibilities, but notice they're all unsound. Obviously, all of the invalid arguments are going to be unsound because a sound argument has to be valid. And in addition to being valid, a sound argument has to have true premises. So all of the valid arguments with false premises, those can't be sound. There's just no such thing as a valid argument with true premises and false conclusions, so that's not going to be sound. There's no, no possibility of an argument like that. The only sound arguments are ones with validity and true premises, which, because it's valid, would guarantee a true conclusion. All right, that is validity and soundness. And remember, validity and soundness are terms that we apply to deductive arguments. But there was the other kind of argument that we talked about, inductive arguments, ones that aren't aiming for deductive validity and soundness. Instead, they're arguing for something slightly different. It's not that we're guaranteeing the truth of the conclusions and the premises. We are suggesting merely that if the premises are true, then it is very probable or very likely that the conclusion is true. Since inductive arguments aren't valid and they're not even aiming for it, we need another concept in order to talk about this. And the concept that we usually use, the term that's used to talk about the structural quality of an inductive argument is strength. So we say that an inductive argument is strong if we would say that the truth of the premises means that the conclusion is very likely. The truth of the premises might mean that the conclusion is not particularly likely, in which case we would call that argument weak. So notice something that's different here when we're talking about strength than when we were talking about validity. When we were talking about validity, there was this question of, do the premises guarantee the conclusion, yes or no? This is a binary question, whether the argument is valid or invalid. Strength, on the other hand, is a little bit mushier. It's kind of an ambiguous term. Strength is referring to how probable it is that the conclusion would follow from the premises, how likely it is that the conclusion would follow from the premises. And we know that there's a whole wide spectrum of probability or likelihood. So we can have arguments that are very strong, we can have arguments that are very very weak, and we can have arguments that are somewhere in the middle, like kind of sort of strong, stronger than they are weak, but not like impressively strong, or kind of middle of the road, somewhat probable, somewhat improbable, that reflects the relative strength or weakness of an inductive argument that we might be concerned with. So this means that um, questions about the relative strength and weakness of an inductive argument are, for example, kind of difficult to write multiple choice or true-false true, false, true false questions about. There were sorts of uh, 
uh, evaluating the relative strength or weakness of an inductive argument is the sort of thing where we could imagine that some reasonable people might disagree about. Um, hopefully we're going to demonstrate that there are some that we would expect almost everybody assembled to be like, yeah, that's pretty strong, even if we would debate just where exactly on this spectrum, like would I put it here, or would I put it here, or would I put it like maybe somewhere over here. Eh, reasonable people might disagree, but hopefully we can get to the point where we can all agree like, yeah, that's on the stronger end of the spectrum, or no, that's on the weaker end of the spectrum. Okay, that's strength. So let's do like we did before. Let's look at some, uh, some examples of uh, inductive arguments and try to determine how strong or weak they might be. So consider the first one there, albino ravens are so rare that less than one of them are spotted in a given year. Therefore, the next raven that I see will probably not be an albino raven. I have one premise, and I draw one conclusion from that one premise. And that premise states that albino ravens are so rare that less than one of them are spotted in a given year. That makes it very, very unlikely that I would see an albino raven tomorrow. And therefore, it makes the conclusion drawn uh, that the next raven I see will probably not be an albino raven very, very likely. Pardon me. <laughs> Bless me. So it makes that conclusion very, very likely, and this argument is strong. Notice that it's not valid, though. Albino ravens being so rare that less than one of them are spotted in a given year, um, this doesn't guarantee that the next raven that I see won't be an albino raven. It makes it very unlikely that it would be a, a, an albino raven. But I can't possibly get to that certainty of validity with an argument like this. It can be very, very strong, but it just can't be valid. It's not even aiming for it. Compare that to uh, the one right below. Tim is left-handed, Faith is left-handed, Hamad is left-handed, and Dolores is left-handed. Therefore, it seems likely that most people are left-handed. Here's an argument where I seem to be trying to uh, make a generalization. I'm trying to recognize some kind of pattern of left-handed people, and I'm, I'm trying to say, like, that pattern probably applies to everybody. Uh, sometimes arguments like this can work, but this one is pretty bad. I'm trying to draw a conclusion about the left-handedness of most people, and what am I basing it off of? What are the reasons? What are the premises that I offer to support that? Well, I point out that Tim is left-handed, Faith is left-handed, Hamad is left-handed, and Dolores is left-handed. That's four left-handed people, and from that, I'm making a generalization about all people probably being left-handed, or at least most people being left-handed. There really just isn't enough evidence to base that on. So we would say that this argument is inductive. Uh, that's not what makes it bad. What makes it bad is that it's a weak inductive argument. It really doesn't offer an awful lot of support for its conclusion. And we could imagine like things that would make it stronger, like just more people, right? More than four left-handed people in order to make that generalization. Consider that last one there. 99.34% of all UNCG students are female. Therefore, if you're a UNCG student, you're probably female. That argument is pretty strong. And again, if you're sitting there wondering, like, I don't know, that argument doesn't seem strong at all. After all, I'm a UNCG student and I'm not female. This is what you're thinking to yourself. At least all the male students could possibly be thinking about that. Or maybe female students are thinking, like, what if I was a male student? And I would read that and be like, oh, that conclusion is just false. That has nothing to do with whether the argument is strong or weak. Remember? An argument is strong or weak on the basis of the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. But this says nothing about whether or not the premises or the conclusion are actually true or false. So for example, what we've got going on in that argument is I'm starting with a premise that 99.34% of all UNCG students are female. That premise is just not true. If it were true, then it would make the conclusion incredibly likely. And that's what makes the argument strong. But just because the argument is strong, that doesn't mean that its conclusion is necessarily true. It doesn't even mean that its conclusion is probably true. A strong argument's conclusion is only probable if all of the premises are true. We need another concept. Just like we saw with validity and soundness, we have strength, which refers to the structure of an inductive argument, but what about some concept that's going to say, like, on top of strength, are those premises actually true? And for this, we have a new concept, right? A new term. It can't be soundness, because soundness requires that an argument is valid, and no inductive arguments are valid. So instead, we talk about the cogency of inductive arguments. An inductive argument is cogent if it's strong, 
And on top of that, all of its premises are in fact true. If an argument is cogent, this tells us that um, it is probably the case that the conclusion is true because its strength tells us that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is probably true. And then on top of that, we're saying, and the premises are actually true. Therefore, it's probably the case that the conclusion is true. Examine some arguments, both of which are strong, but only one of which is cogent. Uh, for example, we have there, every one of the previous 44 U.S. presidents has been older than 40 years old. Therefore, the next U.S. president will probably be older than 40 years old. That argument is strong. We have a pattern of 44 U.S. presidents in a row, and in fact, all of the previous uh, 44 U.S. presidents. So every president so far in a streak going on for 44 presidents, having been older than 40 years old, that's a pretty good pattern. That's a, that's a reliable pattern to say that this is probably going to extend to the next U.S. president as well. And in fact, if you have a little bit of extra information here and you know, like, who's even in the race for the upcoming presidential election, you know that like all of the serious candidates are all over 40 years old, so it's incredibly likely that the next U.S. president is probably going to be older than 40 years old. That argument is strong, and on top of that, the premise that it's working from is true, and that makes it cogent. So it's incredibly likely that the conclusion of that argument, that the next U.S. president will probably be older than 40 years old, it's incredibly likely that that's true. Compare that to the one below. Every one of the previous 44 U.S. presidents has been white. And then we draw the conclusion from that. <clears throat> Therefore, the next U.S. president will probably also be white. Now, this has exactly the same structure as the previous argument. We have a pattern that's been persisting for 44 U.S. presidents in a row. And in fact, it's all of the U.S. presidents that there ever have been. That's a pretty good pattern. That's a good track record to make uh, an inferential leap to something about the next U.S. president. What goes wrong with this argument is, despite the fact that it's a strong argument, despite the fact that if the premises were true, the conclusion would probably be true, the premises aren't actually true. We only have one premise, and it's just not true. Every one of the previous 44 US presidents has been white. Well, depending on exactly how we're going to define whiteness and non-whiteness, the last US president, the 44th US president, Barack Obama, is considered by most people, by most standard definitions, to not be a white president, in fact, the first black president. So, uh, therefore, the next U.S. president will probably be white, too. Uh, that may or may not be true. It's certainly, it's not a cogent argument because the premise that I'm building off of, while if it were true, would mean that the conclusion were probably true, that premise just ain't true. So this argument is not cogent. And again, we've got the same sort of chart that we can look at for strong and weak inductive arguments and all of the possible combinations of uh, true or false or likely and unlikely conclusions and premises. Um, what we've got going on here, and we'll notice that the pattern is exactly the same, is that all of the weak arguments can't possibly be cogent because cogency requires strength. And in fact, of the strong arguments, the only ones that are cogent are strong arguments with true premises and a very likely conclusion. There's just no such thing as a strong argument with true premises and an unlikely conclusion, because what it means for the argument to be strong is if the premises were true, then the conclusion would be likely. So this doesn't exist, and the strong arguments with false premises aren't cogent either. Same sort of setup as we saw before for validity and soundness, only now we're talking about strength, weakness, and cogency. So uh, if we wanted to get some practice with this, uh, we can take a look at this worksheet. Um, do, 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 actually, if we'll back up here, uh, if you want to look at this on the Prezi, you can kind of zoom in. Um, there's some extra practice there for old stuff. This has to do with telling whether or not a sentence is a statement or a non-statement, and this one has to do with identifying whether or not a collection of statements is actually an argument. But that's old stuff. Let's look at the new stuff. <clears throat> Here we have six arguments, and I'm asking you to tell me whether or not those arguments seem to be aiming towards a deductive structure or an inductive structure. And then uh, below that, I ask you to follow up, and if we decided that they were deductive, to tell whether they're valid, and if they're valid, whether they're sound. And if they're inductive, to tell us whether they're strong, and if they're strong, to tell whether or not they're cogent. As it turns out, determining 
soundness and cogency can be kind of difficult. We'll see exactly why in just a little while. Um, but tell you what let's do. Uh, why don't you pause the video lecture here, take a look at these six exercises, determine whether or not they're deductive or inductive arguments, and determine whether or not they are valid. If they're deductive, are they valid? And if they're inductive, are they strong? And uh, pause the, vid uh, the video lecture, do those, and then check back in, and I'll talk about how I would have answered these questions. Ready? Go ahead and pause the video lecture now. Okay, so presumably you've gone through those exercises and taken a look at them for yourself and determined whether or not those six arguments are deductive or inductive, and if they're deductive, are they valid? Uh, if they're inductive, are they strong? Let's start with the first one. Bill was drunk when he left the bar last night, and his car was dented this morning. Plus, Bill has a history of drunk driving. Therefore, Bill was most likely driving drunk last night. Well, this is an interesting sort of argument. It does seem like the conclusion is supported, and in fact, I might even go so far as to say that the conclusion is pretty well supported, that it's fairly convincing. But it just doesn't seem to be doing the sorts of things that a deductive argument does. It doesn't even seem to be in the right neighborhood for validity. Here's uh, how I would think of it, at least. We note that Bill was drunk when he left the bar last night. Let's assume that that's true. Let's also assume that it's true that his car was dented this morning. And let's also assume that it's true that Bill has a history of drunk driving. Can't all three of those things be true? And it also be true that Bill left the bar drunk last night, walked home instead of driving home, knowing that, like, oh, I've gotten into drunk driving problems before. I have a history of drunk driving, but I'm not going to drunk drive tonight. His car, he left on the street at the bar, and some other person, not Bill, some other person, maybe they were drunk, maybe they were just careless, crashed into his car and dented it. So we end up with Bill being drunk when he left the bar last night, Bill's car being dented this morning, and Bill having a history of drunk driving, but it not being the case that Bill drunk drove last night, that he drove home drunk last night. So this is one where we can see that, yeah, those premises are true, but that doesn't guarantee that the conclusion is true. It's possible for the conclusion to be false while all those premises are true. But that's not really the structure that this argument is going for. It's more kind of like piling up evidence and saying that this would explain a lot of things. This is actually a type of argument known as an abductive argument where we say, you know what, the conclusion that I'm drawing is believable because it would explain all of the other, the other things that I, all of the other information that I have, all the premises are explained by the conclusion. So this argument is inductive, and uh, I'd go ahead and say that it's probably pretty strong. I think that if you knew Bill, and he had a history of drunk driving, you were at the bar last night, saw him leave drunk, and saw his car this morning and it was dented, you would be within your rational warrants to say that Bill probably drove drunk last night. Um, you might possibly be wrong about it, but we're guessing that you would be right more often than you would be wrong, that it's probably the case that this is true. And we're already starting to get a sense, hopefully, for like how, how dicey this might be to, to sort that out. But we'll look a little closer at that when we look in depth at inductive arguments. For the meantime, let's note that one is clearly not deductive. It's definitely inductive, and it seems pretty strong. Could be stronger, certainly could be weaker. Number two, if you get caught speeding, you will be sentenced to life in prison. You did get caught speeding, Therefore, you will be sentenced to life in prison. This is a clear deductive argument. It is clearly deductive. It is clearly a valid argument as well. If I get caught speeding, then I will be sentenced to a life in prison. And I did get caught speeding. If both of those two premises are true, then the conclusion, I will be sentenced to a life in prison, that has to be the case. If the premises are true, the conclusion would have to be true. That's because the structure of this argument is uh, the first premise gives me an if and then a then. If this happens, then this will happen. And then the second premise tells me the if part happens. So my conclusion is like, well, then the then part has to happen if all those premises are true. The argument is deductive. It is valid, but it's not sound. And the reason why it's not sound is that the premise, if I get caught speeding, then I'll be sentenced to life in prison, that's just not true. Maybe I needed a little bit of background knowledge on that in order to know that that premise wasn't true, but hopefully we all know that life in prison is not one of the possible penalties of being caught speeding. All right, so that argument is deductive, it's valid, but it ain't sound because it's got a false premise. Let's look at number three. Selena will have either grits or home fries with her eggs. She isn't getting grits, so she must be getting 
The way this argument works is we start with an either or. Selena will have either grits or home fries with her eggs. And then we say, she's not getting grits. We take one of those either or options away. And all that leaves is home fries as the only available option. This argument is deductive and it's valid. To talk about whether or not it was sound or not, uh, we would have to know whether it's true that Selena will either have grits or home fries with her eggs. We would have to know whether it's true that Selena isn't getting grits. Uh, we don't actually have that information available to us, but if we were trusting and we'd say like, well, provided that those premises are actually true, then sure, it's deductive, it's valid, and on top of that, it's sound. But since I don't know Selena or her breakfast habits, I can't really say for sure whether it's sound. Let's move on to number four. Four out of, uh, sorry, six out of ten dentists recommend Trident gum. Julio is a dentist, therefore it is reasonable to conclude that Julio recommends Trident gum. We can tell that this isn't a deductive argument, that this is in fact an inductive argument. We're going for probability instead of certainty. And in fact, while we are going for probability, it seems to be the case that we don't exactly really get it. Six out of ten dentists recommend Trident gum, and Julio is a dentist, so I suppose this makes it more likely than not that Julio recommends Trident, but not by a long shot. 60% of dentists, that's I suppose most, but it's not an overwhelming most. So this argument is inductive, but it's not particularly strong. In fact, it kind of seems like a weak inductive argument. It's almost as likely that Julio doesn't recommend Trident gum, that he's one of the four out of 10, rather than saying he's one of the six out of 10 that does recommend this gum. All right, inductive, weak. Number four. Number five. All students are sleep deprived. Pooja is sleep deprived. It follows then that Pooja is a student. Now this argument is not actually valid. And it might be tempting to say that because it's not valid then it must be an inductive argument. But notice what's going on here. It does seem like this argument is aiming for validity. It's aiming for a sort of certainty. And one of the clues here is that my first premise is all students are sleep deprived. We're not trying to infer that it's very likely that Pooja is a student. The flavor of this argument seems such that it's trying to conclude conclusively, right? It's trying to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Pooja is a student. Um, the argument is not valid, by the way, because there's something about its structure that's been just a little bit twisted up, uh, a little bit, a little bit um, kind of like rearranged so that it doesn't actually function the way that it should. All students are sleep deprived. That may tr that may be true. In fact, it's, it's not true. But even if it were true that all students are sleep deprived, this doesn't mean that all sleep deprived people are students. Is that clear enough? All students are sleep deprived, but that doesn't mean that only students are sleep deprived. So when we say that all students are sleep deprived and Pooja is sleep deprived, this doesn't actually get us to the conclusion that Pooja is therefore probably certainly anything like that. It doesn't get us to any kind of inkling that Pooja might be a student. All students are sleep deprived. Pooja is a student, therefore she's sleep deprived. That would work just fine. That would be a valid argument. But because we kind of move some things around, because we say all students are sleep deprived and Pooja is sleep deprived, well, we're sitting here wondering like, well, why is she sleep deprived? Maybe she's one of the students who are sleep, all the students are sleep deprived, but there could be other sleep deprived people. There could be, uh, could be that, uh, all the air traffic controllers are also sleep deprived. It could be that all of the insomniacs are sleep deprived. It could be that all of the people with newborn babies who are screaming and crying all night long, that those people are sleep deprived too, even if they aren't students. And Pooja might be one of those people. She might be a new parent with a newborn that's screaming and crying, and that's why she's sleep deprived. And this tells us nothing about whether she's a student or not. This argument is aiming for deductive validity, but it misses. It's a deductive argument that is invalid and is completely busted, in fact. Let's look at number six. If you aren't afraid of haunted houses, you shouldn't be afraid of dark alleyways. After all, both are dimly lit and have a potential for someone jumping out at you. The conclusion of this argument is, if you aren't afraid of haunted houses, you shouldn't be afraid of dark alleyways. And the way that I get to this conclusion is by pointing out that haunted houses and dark alleyways, they have some similarities. So if I'm not afraid of one, I shouldn't be afraid of the other. This is a style of argument known as an argument by analogy. And what makes it tick is I say that two objects have, I demonstrate that they have a certain sort of similarity between them, and then I infer that they have some additional similarity as well. In this case, what we're saying is both of them are dimly lit, both of them have a potential for somebody jumping out at me, 
Therefore, if I'm not afraid of one, then I shouldn't be afraid of the other one. That should, that should be an additional similarity between haunted houses and dark alleyways. This is actually a pretty bad argument by analogy. It's inductive, by the way. All arguments by analogy are inductive. Uh, the similarity between these two cases gives us some kind of sense of the likelihood or the probability of additional similarity, but it doesn't guarantee it. And in fact, it's not even probable that the similarity of like being afraid of both haunted houses or not being afraid of both haunted houses and dark alleyways applies just because of the similarities that have been articulated here. For example, um, there's at least one notable relevant dissimilarity between haunted houses and dark alleyways that comes to mind. And it's incredibly salient to the sort of conclusion that we're trying to draw. Um, sure, haunted houses are dimly lit and they have potential for somebody jumping out at me. Dark alleyways are dimly lit and they have potential for somebody jumping out at me. But haunted houses are fictitious, right? With a haunted house, I go in knowing that it's not real, that it's all just a show designed to make me feel scared. Um, but maybe knowing that it's fantasy means that I don't actually get caught up in it and I'm not actually scared of a haunted house. Compare that to a dark alleyway, which is not explicitly fantasy and where the threats that may lie in a dark alleyway are very real. <clears throat> Now I have a good difference between haunted houses and dark alleyways that tells me that just because I'm not afraid of a haunted house doesn't mean that I'm not afraid of a dark alleyway. In fact, I should not be afraid of the fictitious scary stuff. Maybe I should be afraid of the very real possibly scary stuff that's going on in a dark alleyway. So uh, that argument is inductive. It's not very strong. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's weak because of that obvious dissimilarity between the two cases that I'm trying to make an argument by analogy about. We'll get more into these different styles of inductive arguments when we take a closer look at inductive arguments. Um, because that argument is weak, it can't possibly be cogent. And there, we've done one through six. If you'd like a little bit more exercise, you can take a look at these arguments that we've got right here, and it's the same sort of thing, except we've added one extra little tidbit to it. Um, I've given you an argument where part of it is missing, where there's an implicit premise that I just haven't mentioned, and we need to make it explicit. So for example, if I look at number one there, if you had studied hard, you would have gotten an A, so you must not have studied hard. Mm, I don't really quite have enough in the premises to get me to my conclusion there. And it's not even that like, oh, so that means that it must be an inductive rather than a deductive argument. No, 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 what's going on there is that it seems like some other premise hasn't really been explicitly stated, but it's being assumed there. So what we've got here is if you had studied hard, you would have gotten an A. Um, it seems like what's missing here is the recognition that I didn't get an A. So let's add another premise there. If I had studied hard, I would have gotten an A. I didn't get an A, so I must not have studied hard. All right, I can see that argument. Is that one valid? Is that a deductive argument with validity? Hmm, well, think about it, go through it go through two, three, four, five, and six as well. Uh, supply the missing premise and determine whether it's valid or strong. And if you have any questions about that, you can feel free to email me or catch me in class on Wednesday. In the meantime, uh, please do try to stay safe. Um, you've got a new homework assignment that's been posted. It's a, a, a homework quiz on this material. Um, all of this comes out of chapter three in Louvain's uh, The Power of Critical Thinking. Uh, so our reading assignment's been posted, and also the homework assignment's been posted. Both of those need to be completed before our Wednesday meeting. Um, I hope you're well, and I hope to see you on Wednesday. Until then, toodaloo.